Card Zero, Echoes of the 99, by August Servant, Volume 1. Lecture 11, Darwin's Legacy. It is my belief that being good is a skill that must be developed with conscious effort and continuous practice, with emphasis on the understanding that good is not something that you are. Rather, good is what you do, because we are defined by our deeds. Example, it is the observance of formalities that makes the experience all the richer. In contrast, when we take a closer look at being selfish and self-serving, what we find is that this state of mind is as natural of a practice as breathing and is literally how we survive. But it is not, however, how we thrive, not as a people, and certainly not as a diverse collective of souls. Example, this life is not the only life that we are living, in that we as individuals carry our generation with us like we carry our families. And it will be very short-sighted, cynical, and downright selfish to do only for ourselves while leaving others to carry our dead weight. With the takeaway here being, it is absolutely a moral imperative that each one teach one, and to always remember to lift as you climb, that you may have allies standing with you at all times, no matter your station. A passage from one of Shakespeare's plays comes to mind. E2, Brute? The famous last words of Julius Caesar, even as he was being stabbed in the back, betrayed by a supposed friend, the last to wield the knife in thus delivering the 23rd stab wound. And on a side note, I always found it strange that among 13 senators, Julius had no ally to watch his back. But I digress. Now then, back to the lecture at hand. If you were to ask me, I would tell you that Darwin's observation of survival of the fittest, a term made famous in the fifth edition of On the Origin of Species, was an analysis of beasts and other lower forms of life, not to be confused with Adam or man. The reason being, mankind, that is to say man, does not live by bread and bread alone, and thus to adopt the same rationale in the survival of beasts to human beings is flawed in its comparison, because it's like comparing apples to oranges. What do you mean? Allow me to explain. Where the beasts both rule and survive by claw and fang, man secures both his rule and future dominion by his or her mind, to say, by imagination and fellowship, or by collaboration, to be more specific. So, where the survival of the fittest may leave you stuck in the Hunger Games until you remain the last man on Earth before becoming extinct like all other beasts, the rationale of survival of the friendliest will keep you in a constant state of peace and growth thereby giving you all the time, space, and support needed to create and build back better and better until a tribe becomes a village, a civilization, a nation, so on and so forth, marrying family to family and border to border. And while I will grant you that there are a lot of wars in the Holy Bible, I will also remind you that the only good reason for war is peace. And what better way to sustain that peace than love for all? Question. Define love for all. Answer. We begin by being ever mindful of three observances. First, the only true temperance to power is constant contact with God. Thus, Humility is and will forever remain the ultimate preservative and protector under the law of grace.
Next, a servant sees with his master's eyes. And this is what is meant by the saying, those who accept the beliefs of others cease to observe. And such is the curse of old beliefs and lazy thinking. With the cautionary tale here being, until a person takes full possession of him or herself, anything they say or do is suspect. This is why I say that there is more truth in an outlaw than a senator, due to the authenticity of a heart free of any strings attached. Finally, man's best friend or not, nobody likes a barking dog. And how is a constant complainer any different? Understand that being right gives you no excuse to be rude, arrogant, or cruel. The reason being, a teacher that fails to impart knowledge is no greater than the student who cannot learn from them. And as one feels more superior to the other, resting solely on their mental prowess, the other grows hotter with rage, thereby gaining the upper hand. Because arrogance is no match for anger. And should they ever come together, only one will bleed. You have powers you know not of. The only way it gets easier is by giving more of yourself. The power and lift of spirit can only be achieved by a wholehearted desire, passing through physical strength, mental power, and emotional energy before the spirit can come online. Contrary to popular belief, we are all psychic. And I say this because there is always two voices in our heads at all times. But the thing is, we are only supposed to listen to one. And this is not a question of good versus evil. Because in being human, we are undoubtedly both. And with no one to blame but ourselves, we are left to face the only choice that ever was. Opportunity versus decay. To say success or poverty in layman's terms, of which both are powers of the mind more than anything else. Today, seeing only good, greatness, and success must be the choice that you make against all apparent odds and circumstances telling you otherwise. With a knowing beforehand, that if you persist, one day it will be your reality, free of contention or doubt. And what makes this possible is the fact that we are all threefold beings in possession of a body, soul, and spirit, collectively providing us with the potential of being clairvoyant and thus capable of initiating and or experiencing any number of psychic phenomena. So much so that it all comes down to a question of which perception you choose to focus your attention on. Allow me to offer the following analogy in terms of working or focusing one's attention in the mental realm and not the spiritual. I offer you the story of the cat and the queen. Once there was a cat sent to London by the peasants to meet the queen. How thrilled they were on the anticipation of its return and the prospects of hearing all that had happened in the court. The banquets, the gowns, the music, etc. Then came the disappointment and sadness to learn that all the cat saw was a mouse. With the moral here being, the cat had a mouse consciousness and was more interested in the rodent than it was with the queen. And this is not ignorance, but a programmed life response so intuitive that it goes beyond conscious choice. Now then, the same is true of man. To say that the godless and the atheists see only lack, pain, and suffering. To say only the absolute worst of the physical on this earth plane. Never realizing that to look up you must first think high thoughts. Figuratively speaking, you understand. Still, you must know, or at least come to terms with the fact that, 
Our consciousness does not far exceed our ambitions in life. And where our attention goes, our energy and awareness flows. What do you mean? Do you spend your time pondering the presence of angels? Or are you in league with demons? Now follow me here. It's all in your head, as in accordance to the saying, act as though I were, and I am. Need I remind you that it is the act of faith that promotes the feelings of expectancy. And as it is written, the law of attraction will do the rest. Putting all Hollywood and theatrics aside, darkness is not an entity, only the absence of light. God is light. And where light is, there is no darkness. The ignorant, the finite, and the limited, they are those that perceive darkness. They see it clearly, giving all of their attention to it by feeding it all of their fears, worries, and anxieties. Meanwhile, the wise, infinite, and limitless, they ignore the dark, looking only towards the light, knowing that all which is unseen is just an illusion caused by the lack of light and nothing more, thereby giving no power to the darkness. With the moral here being, it is from looking away from that which is corrupt that we can behold that which is perfect. The Walking Dead. Consider the question, how did you get here in the first place? Alone? Or through the portal of your mother's legs, by the design of your father's seed. So that's two people right there. Never mind the doctor or the midwife that delivered you. Or all the support given to both your mom and dad while you spent nine months in a womb not of your creation, waiting to be delivered into this world. Now then, what I am trying to convey to you is, alone. You are nothing but an ungrateful parasite thinking that you know more than the process that got you this far. And in your own blind arrogance, still to this day, you refuse to acknowledge not only God, a higher power, or your own parents, but also the support of all the thousands of people working every day to aid you while you sleep in a state of willful ignorance. You say you don't believe, and that's fine, because you are dead anyway. You are that piece of untouched fruit rotting at the base of the tree of life, waiting to be consumed by another life force, man or beast, and righteously so. How much so? Good question, because you need to know the consequences of your actions or the lack thereof. So believe me when I tell you that, even a devil worshiper is closer to God than an atheist. The reason being, the devil is still an angel too. And if you're paying attention, what that means is, there are fates out there even worse than death or Satan. Fates of which, I might add, you are blindly subjecting yourself to for no other reason than a willful ignorance. To rise and rise again. When we, the followers of Jesus, the Most High, speak of our devotion to God the Father, we are setting our sights on the best supernal experience out there, both in this life and in the hereafter, once we have passed on. And with that being said, the absolute worst place to be is alone. To say, beholden to none above or below, recognizing no deity or entity to pledge or declare your homage, faith, or fealty to. And if you don't know, there are names for those kinds of people. Food, fodder, tools, waste. You get the idea. And it is with the above mentioned well in mind that we can begin to answer the age-old question of 
which came first, the chicken or the egg? Point one, Noah didn't bring any eggs on the ark. He brought a hen and a rooster. Point two, eggs don't lay eggs. Hens lay eggs. As a matter of fact, a hen will lay an egg every 26 hours. However, no egg will hatch if it is not fertilized by the seed of a rooster first. And even then, it must be kept warm and tended to by a hen for 21 days before it will hatch. Point three, all that was first came from a seed, and that which was next was born from an egg. Man carries the seed, woman carries the egg, hence the saying, Father Earth and Mother Nature. With the hidden meaning being, this earth plane is the seed from which man was born from the dust of the earth, as it is written in Genesis 2.7. The Book of Noah I came across this passage in the book of Noah that suggests that Noah did not build the infamous Noah's Ark as outlined in Genesis 5:32 through 10, 1. From the book of Noah, 67, 1. And in those days, the word of the Lord came to me, and he said to me, Noah, behold, your lot has come up before me, a lot without reproach, a lot of love and uprightness. 67.2 And now the angels are making a wooden structure, and when the angels come out from that task, I will put my hand on it and keep it safe. And a change shall take place, so that the dry ground may not remain empty. Commentary. It is so important that people in general realize that the Holy Bible is not a complete body of work, but a collection of hand-picked books by people with an agenda. So let it be known by a self-professed Bible thumper and Jesus freak that the Bible is not the full story. And because it is so convoluted with so many contradictory ideas and practices, it cannot stand alone and is not sufficient in providing a full grasp on the topic of theology, nor the study of divinity. Now then, first and foremost, no book in any amount of volumes can encompass the idea, works, or scope of God. And while the Bible is a good and healthy start, it can and will leave you with more questions than answers, which, in my opinion, is a good thing for two reasons. First, you don't have to have the right answers if you ask the right questions, for in them lays the path to all knowing. Second, because God is a sevenfold being, the study of the Almighty is more than just a lifelong study. It is an eternity of wonder and mystery constantly unfolding in real time within us. Lastly, a true God is a living being, and thus the works of a living being can never cease. And likewise, so should the study of such a being never truly end. Salah. The Warrior's Creed Being willing to fight does not automatically give you the requisite skill needed to defeat your opponent. Baiting someone into action is one of the oldest tricks in the book. Therefore, before you move, make sure that it is by your own calculated judgment and not by the design of others. The true warrior understands that your strength of arm is found in what you are fighting for. To say that a true warrior's mind is his principal weapon, because he fights with his heart, 
not with his hands. Thus, the mechanics of the way is internal, and what you see on the outside is merely the expression in translation, depending on the perspective of the interpreter. Lastly, those that win understand clearly what they were fighting for, and thus know when to stop fighting. In this way, we learn that victories claimed simply for the sake of killing and laying waste are just the perpetuations of more war, and that having the wisdom to lay down one's arms is the beginning of peace. My creed. I am a veteran, and I am also a man of Christ. One speaks to my discipline and work ethic, while the other speaks to my demeanor, character, and destiny. And it is in being a Christian soldier that I am able to navigate my way through the perils and madness of this world with a light heart, confident in my actions, and certain that there is a place for me in the great beyond, making my death merely a release, and my actions leading up to it the springboard catapulting me upward into the great ascension, the kingdom of heaven. And I know this, for Christianity is founded upon the forgiveness of sins and an empty tomb, that man would no longer throw off his body in death, but that it would be transformed into the body electric. God is love, sure enough. But God is also law, and as you practice his ways and hold to his tenets, don't call it hard, call it necessary. Pay whatever price truth costs, and know that while there is no easy answer or certain fix, your attitude, demeanor, and enthusiasm aimed toward any obstacle in your path will always sway the odds in your favor and work to inspire others to root for you, if not, win them over entirely to your cause. Affirmations 1. I deny all belief in loss and separation, and affirm that God is my joy, love, and peace. 2. I will that the will of God be done. 3. My eyes are God's eyes. I see with eyes of spirit. Scripture 1. The Gospel of Thomas 24. Jesus' disciples said to him, Show us the place where you are, since it is necessary for us to seek it. He said to them, Whosoever has ears, let him hear. There is light within a man of light, and he lights up the whole world. If he does not shine, he is darkness. 2. Psalms 119, 18 Open my eyes, dear Lord, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law and thy guidance. 3. Psalms 142.7 Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. I submit to you. Be worthy. Please allow me to introduce myself. You can call me August Servant, and it is a privilege to bring to you my captured Echoes of the 99 by way of Card Zero, the Fool.